Good afternoon. Uh, it seems that everybody here has come to learn. Uh, I uh, should be honest. I invited myself here. <laughs> uh, I was supposed to go to this uh, big meeting of Bayesians in Banaras, which I'm going to. I was invited, and so I'll be running away after a few days. But when I saw the announcement for this meeting, uh, I felt compelled to come here. I thought it was an unusual opportunity for me as a Bayesian to talk to people who are applying Bayesian methods. So I also wrote to the organizer at, uh, at Varanasi and I said, look, do you know there is another big meeting here? But he said, but they're not statisticians. They are non-statisticians. <laughs> so I said, those are the kind of people I want to talk to. I don't want to talk to all of you again and again and again. So I seized this opportunity to come here and I was very grateful to the two organizers who responded very positively almost instantaneously and invited me to come here. So I'm very thankful. Then came the question of what I should speak on. As a sales pitch, I said I have done some work in particle physics, uh, of which I know nothing, but there was a problem, and it was published. I said maybe I can talk on that. But then it occurred to me that there'll be real particle physicists here and I will look like, uh, I will look like a Boy Scout telling them uh, particle physics. So they were kind enough to offer me the topics that I wanted to talk on. So I'm going to first talk today on and give you an introductory talk on what I consider to be the Bayesian paradigm. I'm also going to talk to you about what I read physicists say about these kind of ideas. I have no problems with biologists. I have no problems with others. But physicists, there is a problem. They have a way of looking at uncertainty. And some of them are turning around. When I saw the program, I saw this great talk on the brain that you're giving. And I said to myself, I should really talk to you more. So I'm interested in all these things. And with that, I'll uh, give you my talk. I've given this talk many times before. In fact, the IMS, the Institute for Mathematical Statistics, wants me to put all this together and uh, uh, submit it as uh, a publication in one of their electronic journals, which I have not done. So with that, as a preamble, let me just start. So what do I do? How do I move forward? forward to Foot proper. Uh, no, or maybe the next one. Uh, the this one? Bottom one? The bottom one. Yes. OK, so I'm going to talk about the Bayesian paradigm for quantifying uncertainty. There are a lot of fine, subtle points here that I'd like to bring out. The mathematics is absolutely elementary, but the arguments are kind of nice, I think. This is an overview, and uh, this is uh, my title and my affiliation. So what is the essence of the Bayesian paradigm? At least the way I understand it. And the essence is simply the following, is that the only satisfactory way to quantify uncertainty is by probability. And that probability is personal to an individual or to a group of individuals acting as a whole. So the first part is, the probability part is mathematical. The interpretation of probability and its ramifications are philosophical and psychological. So the next question comes is, uh, what do we mean by uncertainty? And why must we quantify uncertainty? <coughs> well. The answer to that is very simple. Uncertainty is anything that you don't know. It need not be un universal. That is, my uncertainty may not be your uncertainty. You may know more by virtue of your knowledge or by virtue of the fact that uh, you have access to information. But for me, it is uncertain. Therefore, the uncertainty is personal. Uh, thus, like probability, uncertainty is also personal because your uncertainty could be sure knowledge to the other. Furthermore, uncertainty is also time dependent because what is uncertain to you now may become known to you for sure later on, obviously. I'm uncertain of the weather now and uh, <coughs> tomorrow I'll be sure of what the weather is, but even in the afternoon my uncertainty about the nature of the weather will change. So uncertainty is time indexed. 
we want to keep that in mind. Thus, probability must uh, carry two indices and like Rajiva Karandikar who is here, I was trained in a different way and nobody told me all these things. Uh, they did not tell me that probability must carry two indices. One is me denoted by that little figure and the other is denoted by tau. So, it should carry these two indices. What happens is that in the non-personal view of probability, there is no place for such indices. There is no person and there is no time in the non-personal view of probability. Why do we quantify uncertainty? We quantify uncertainty to invoke the scientific method and the scientific method mandates measurement against a scale. So, if we are scientists, we want, like to measure. If we are going to measure, we need a scale and therefore, we need a scale for uncertainty. Probability is the scale for measuring uncertainty and the Bayesian paradigm mandates that it be the only scale. There are some others in the profession, some very well known people like Lotfi Zadeh who thinks that probability is not the correct metric, who thinks that his possibility theory and belief functions and other such devices are the correct metric. But the Bayesian position is that probability is the scale and uh, that is the scale we should use. Let us introduce some notation and terminology. Let x1 denote an uncertain quantity to a person at time tau. So, we have to keep the person and the time always in mind. For example, x1 could be the failure time of a structure, the maximum stress experienced by the structure over its service time or next year's stock market percentage gain and in many applications you can just <coughs> replace your qualifier for x1 by whatever it is that interests you. Thus, x1 is merely a label. Let little x1 denote the possible numerical values that capital X1 can take. For example, little x1 could be 20 years, that is the failure time of a structure, or a little x1 could be 15 pounds per square inch, or the stock market percentage gain could be 8.5 percent. When x1 denotes an uncertain event like rain or shine tomorrow, or failure or survive by the year's end, or pass or fail, and so on and so forth little x1 takes two values 1 or 0. So, little so x1 equals 1 will denote the event that it rains tomorrow or the item survives and so on so forth. In what follows it suffices to focus only on events of the kind x1 equals little x1 where little x1 is 1 or 0. Just for purpose of discussion we keep ourselves restricted to the case of uncertain events and not uh, complicate things by other matters. So, what is our aim? Our aim is to quantify this person's uncertainty about the event x equals x1 at time tau using the metric of probability. So, that is our problem. Oops, what happened? Uh, Let us see. Resume? Yeah. Okay. I guess I pressed the wrong button. Okay. The next question that comes in the picture is in order to do this quantification, we want to exploit any background information here. Did it fall down? Okay. We want to exploit any background information capital H that the person who is missing here right now may have about x1 at time tau and denote this by h of tau. H stands for history. Bear in mind that h may change with tau because as time marches on the person is liable to learn more about this uncertain event, but is still unsure whether little x1 is 1 or 0. 
With the above in place, the person's uncertainty about this event at time tau in the light of h tau as measured by probability is denoted by this full subscripted expression. So, so sorry, uh, the person, uh, you can, but you know, the typing becomes hard. <laughs> 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 but it's implicit that on the left hand side, you have the person's probability at time tau of this uncertain event in the light of history. Now, I introduce a new notation. I, well, it's not new, it's, it's implicit, but I like to make it explicit. I like to introduce the semicolon here, and I like to introduce the convention that everything to the left of the semicolon is unknown, and everything to the right of the semicolon is known. Uh, that convention helps me quite a bit. Furthermore, this, this expression is a number taking all values between 0 and 1, both inclusive, but exclusive under a personalistic view. That is, a probability of 0 or 1 is not meaningful in the personalistic interpretation of probability. So you never assign probability 0 or 1 in the personalistic view of probability, because, because I'll tell you in a few, uh, few slides later on. So the next question comes, the interpretations of probability. There is the relative frequency view, which is an objectivistic view, wherein probability is the limit of the ratio, the ratio of the frequency. That is one interpretation of probability. Under this interpretation, the person h and tau do not matter so, this left-hand expression is simply this one. This is the way most of us were introduced to probability without this extra paraphernalia. But that, inter that, uh, that elimination of the paraphernalia that you see here tantamounts to looking at probability as either a relative frequency or something else. And there are other things that uh, I'll either talk today or in my lecture tomorrow. So, at this time, I'm uncertain at time tau. I know h of tau, all my knowledge at time tau, all my relevant knowledge. And uh, at tau plus 1, the whole thing changes. Yeah. <coughs> It's about God. It's about, it's about, it's about, it's about, it's about a, a set of information that has been specified. The set has been specified to a computer, and the computer can calculate the probability based on that information. Okay. It's not like a, it's not a subjective personal case. I know. Like it's, 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 a, it's rigorously defined by, by a set of information, and just the time and space are relative to an observer. So probabilities are relative to I told you we have problems with the physicists, and uh, <laughs> this is a complete, <laughs> complete, uh, what, what can I say, complete proof of my claim. <laughs> but I'll get back to you, because I've been reading some papers by, written by some very distinguished physicists right now, just as recently as three and four months ago, about quantum, uh, about, I, I have some literature with me, I'll be happy to share it with you. We can talk more. No, I, I, I uh, let, let me come back to this, okay? I'd be happy to come back. Uh, uh, just a remark, one of the biggest polemicists for Bayesian statistics in the 20th century was a physicist, E.T. James. Oh, no, I'm coming I, to all that. Yeah. To, between today and tomorrow, I'll come to all that. No, there was Jeffries. Uh, yes, uh, there Jeffrey, was yeah. Niels Bohr. Uh -huh, yes. The yes. big battle between Bohr and Einstein had to do with all this. Heisenberg, Bohr, they're all coming slowly, you know. <laughs> they were there. By the way, I noticed that your, uh, the meeting announcement does not have a picture of Bayes. It has a picture of Laplace. There is no picture of Bayes. No, 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> it's uncertain what bays look like. <laughs> no, there are pictures of bays. There are pictures of bays. Um, uh, they are not, uh, it's uncertain that they are authentic, let's say. Oh, sure. <laughs> that's, that's a possibility. Okay. That's the only bays we know. Well, it's certain that what you have is not authentic. Space. Actually, the website it, says it, it's it, not last It doesn't matter so because the know. truth of the yeah. matter is that Reverend Bayes did not do any Bayesian statistics. It was done by Laplace. So Laplace is the true Bayesian in my, in my, uh, you know, in my reading of this whole thing. So Laplace is the right person in this game. Okay, uh, the, the point here, again, is that the probability that x equals x can only be assessed under repeated observation of this event. And this view demands data and here P, that x equals x is unique, which is what the uh, physicist community wants. Yes. That's, that's, that's the interpretation. Well, let me, let me go on with this because I, tomorrow I will talk about more about the problems with these interpretations. Today I just want to tell you what the Bayesian does. That, that is the interpretation of probability, that is the relative frequency interpretation of probability due to von Mises and due to when. For some reason when, and I'll give you the history tomorrow, went through that particular interpretation. Well, okay. I don't really want to slow you up too much, but just on the question of independence of, of I don't know, history or whatever, if, if you're talking about a Popperian propensity interpretation. I'm coming to Popper too. But it's all clearly related. Popper, is rela Popper would subscribe to the right-hand side. Yeah, but on the other hand, propensities are clearly tied to a particular chance setup. So you, ha you exactly. have some sort of reference anyway. Exactly. I'll talk about Popper because I'm very attracted to Popper right now and Pierce. You must have... Peirce. Peirce. Pier Charles Peirce. No, no, Pierce, the American uh, philosopher, mathematician, Pierce. Okay. Charles Sanders. Yes, I'll yes. talk about... They pronounce it Pierce. Oh, oh Pierce, so okay. Spell it Pierce let, me just, it let me just move on with this, uh, with the promise to answer every question. Uh, that I know the answer to. Okay, the relative frequency interpretation of probability is the basis of the classical theory of statistical inference with its notions of unbiased estimation, type 1 and type 2 errors, and the whole uh, material that constitutes uh, statistical uh, literature and practice is based on the relative frequency interpretation of probability. The Bayesian statistical in inference does not entail the above notions. Indeed, many Bayesians are quite vocal in rejecting them. So a good Bayesian would not necessarily subscribe to the notion of type 1 and type 2 errors, maximum likelihood estimation, minimum variance, all the machinery. The Bayesian would essentially not subscribe to those. Now let's go to this interpretation of probability. Let us look at this probability expression given here. What does it mean? Well, there are many meanings given to this, but the one that I will start with, which is mildly attractive, is due to DeFinetti, who was another probabilist. And DeFinetti tried to give an answer to this by the following. It is the amount that this person is prepared to stake at time tau in exchange for one, it could be any currency you like, should x equals x1 occur in a two-sided bet. So the important catch word is a two-sided bet. And I want to emphasize this because one distinguished <coughs> physicist whose name escapes me for this moment, he's at Cornell, has written on quantum theory and says the paradoxes of quantum theory 
can be resolved if we take a personal view of probability. And everything what he says is right, except he fails to acknowledge the notion of a two-sided bet. And I wrote to him about it, and he gave me some kind of an answer. But uh, uh, it's important that in the personalistic view, or in the personal betting view, the bet be two-sided. If x1 equals x does not occur, then the person loses the amount staked. So one way to make personal probability operational is to claim that it is my personal bet on this uncertain event with the understanding that it's a two-sided bet, and I'll explain what a two-sided bet means, and I'll lose the money I put on the table if the event doesn't occur. Well, what does it really mean? It means that this is the amount of money I'm prepared to put up so that my true belief is reflected in the amount of money that I'm willing to stake. Okay. So, so there's a penalty. So this is how the Th exactly. There's a penalty, but we have to be careful. It's a two-sided bet. That point does not come through clearly, but that was De Finetti's genius that he attributed this to be a two-sided bet. I am going to do that, okay? It's, 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 uh, it's very important that the bet be two-sided. So here probability is a gamble, and the two-sided bet ensures that the person's declared probability is an honest reflection of his or her uncertainty. Okay, so if you're betting, and let's say you're betting with a coin, heads or tails, and if your coin is loaded, then obviously you will stake your money with the intention of gaining the maximum possible amount from your opponent. That essentially makes you dishonest. So probability requires, the probability specification requires a sense of true belief. And the true belief is ensured by the two-sided bet. I'm coming to that in the next paragraph. So. What is a two-sided bet? A two-sided bet, if the person stakes P1 for the future occurrence of x1 equals little x1, then the person is also prepared to stake 1 minus P1 for x1 equals to little x1 not occurring. And the key is that the person who is this person's boss or the person against whom is betting gets to choose the size of the bet. So it's like uh, this uh, puzzle we have. You have a cake, piece of cake, and it has to be cut in two pieces. And there is some problem that the first one to cut shouldn't be able to get more. So it's a similar thing. So if, if I, I mm -hmm. go back to the previous slide, uh, you sure? So um, if you are prepared to say it's a coin, and yeah. uh, you know nothing about the coin, so you ex uh, your probability should be fifty percent in exchange for one rupee. I should be willing to stake 50 paise. Right. Uh, but this seems to mean that half the time I will lose 50 paise and half the time I will gain one rupee. L l change change yeah. that. Suppose there is a coin <coughs> whose you are not sure if it's loaded or unloaded. Right. But you suspect it could be. It could it be could loaded be either way too. Yeah. So, so you examine the coin sincerely. Right. And you say this coin is slightly bent. Yes. Therefore, I don't think heads will come up as often as it should. So let's say you do suppose heads will come up half the time. How much should you? You, you, you bet 50, 50 cents. But it seems to me that you stake 50 cents. Uh, half the time you will lose it. The other half you will gain one dollar. Uh, actually, so you're going to toss only once. But uh, you, you still expect to gain more than you lose, right? Let's think of the case where you're only tossing once. Yes. Because if you're making a prediction of uh, so you're making a financial decision or you're predicting some event which is only going to happen once. Right. Let's look at that case. Yes. You are an expert of probability and you have a genuine belief that the probability should be reflected in a 75-25 bet. So you, you say, I'm pretty sure the event is going to happen. So you're prepared to put 75 cents. Yes. Now, Suppose, uh, and suppose the event happens. Right. 
then you get a dollar back, yes. which means you gain 25 cents. Oh, I see. Okay, you lose the 75, but you still get the dollar. Yeah. You get I the dollar. Okay. Right. I'm sorry. Now, if, if, if I was absolutely sure that the coin was loaded on two sides, but you were not, right. okay. then why would I put 75 cents? Why not I put 99 cents? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, why not I put I, less? I missed the part that you lose the amount staked anyway. That's right. But if you win, you get the dollar. Yeah, yeah. That's so right. That, that expected return yeah. is always zero. Okay. Right. Okay. And, 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 and your boss gets to choose the size of the bet. Okay. Okay. So that, yeah. okay. So the two-sided bet enforces honesty because the boss gets to choose the size of the bet. Okay. okay. The stake is P1. The stake is P1, where P1 is. Reward of one. Reward is always one. If you want to change the reward, then you have to change the one. Well, we choose one as the standard. To we, we can, you know, probability is always between zero and one, and one is the unit, you know, by which we work. Okay. So, what's the point here? The point is this. Thus, under the personal or subjective interpretation of interpretation, probability is not unique. Because if we have a coin, and if I'm going to gamble against this gentleman, and uh, you're going to gamble, Rahul is going to gamble, he may know more about the coin, and his amount would be different than mine. Now, what I'm doing right now is I'm not taking a position on how, what position of, at this point in time, I'm not taking a position on the interpretation. All I'm trying to do is explain to you what the personal personal interpretation of probability is. My personal view is that this interpretation is the more encompassing one, but if you prefer not to use this view, you may proceed using the alternate view, in which case you're not a Bayesian, and in which case you'll have to go to another meeting. So... <laughs> you have to be out. To be Sorry? You have to be moralistic to be a It's a matter I would like to discuss tomorrow. You know, uh, in fact, I have a slide on that also as to where the Bayesians are also going. So some Bayesians have decided not to be too moralistic, and they call themselves objective Bayesians, but they will be breaking certain rules. Okay, so I think the point I was trying to make is that the probability is dynamic with tau, and it cannot take the value 0, 1. This is another key here, that in the personalistic setup, and then I'll say a little bit about Kolmogorov, because uh, I also read some of the writings of Kolmogorov, not, not the mathematical side, but the philosophical side, and I'll, I'll just tell you something more about that. But in the personalistic setup, you cannot take a value of 0 and 1, and... Can you explain the point when you cannot take 0 and 1? I'll tell you what, it's going to take me a long time. Uh, but But... What will happen if you engage in a two-sided bet with the value 0 and 1? Nothing is gained, nothing is lost, so why gamble? That's basically what it is. It's general view if it's quite okay to assign a value of 1 to a truism like P or not P. <sighs> well, the same... Of course, when you're making bets, it so doesn't one side is going to come out true. So. Uh, well, but the other side gets to choose the size of the bet, so, you know, you may end up, you may end up penalizing yourself. That's, that's the yeah, yes, I, I agree with you, but that's why I put it there. It has to be between zero and one. Can we proceed, please? <laughs> it's, it, otherwise, you know. Uh, we can uh, have lots of discussion over beer later, but uh, let's <laughs> proceed the best to <laughs> Okay. Um, Okay, now comes some mechanics, the rules of probability. Okay, so what happens with all this? So we have two interpretations of probability, at least. We have the objective view, which uh, the physicists and others like, and some many statisticians. In fact, a lot of them are meeting in Chennai, and most of them are going to like the objective view. Then we have the people meeting in Varanasi who are supposed to like the subjective view. 
We have these two interpretations of probability and then you have people like Popper and all also into the mix and you have some physicists into the mix and all. But no matter what position you take, the following rules of probability hold. That is, these rules tell how the uncertainties should combine and the word cohere is the word, therefore they say that uh, Bayesians should be coherent. That means they should respect the rules of probability all the time. So to Bayesians and probabilists of all persuasions, sorry, uh, all persuasions, coherence is sacrosanct, it is a must. Now I'll go through these fast, but you have seen all these. Consider two uncertain events, then the three rules are convexity, which says that all values between 0 and 1 of probability are allowed. In the objective view, 0 and 1 is also allowed. In the personalistic view, you have to exclude 0 and 1. Sorry. If you have full knowledge and then if you're gambling, you're being essentially dishonest. It's not possible. What? It's not possible. I have full knowledge about Sure. I've tossed a coin. I've looked at it. I'm going to ask you. Oh, before that, I'm not sure. Right. But suppose I'm sure for some reason. Suppose I have secret information. Suppose it's political situation and I have some secret information and I try to give probabilities, sell probabilities to this gentleman, then I have to be completely honest if I'm the seller of a probability, in which case, because he gets to choose the size of the bet, and if I'm pretty sure, and if I stake one, and he stakes the other side of the bet, I'll lose my dollar. I need to go on. I really need to go on, otherwise I'll be here for the whole afternoon. Yes. Yes, then I don't do the probability makes only sense when you don't know. Yeah. After the event, in the personalistic view, the probability does not make sense. So are exactly. That's what you're saying. That's early. Situations of certainty will not be considered at all. These are not considered to be okay, let, let's have further discussion of this point uh, at tea time or uh, after the day session. Perhaps. Okay. So, Oh, yeah. you can stop me and no, I can please, continue please, tomorrow. Uh, no, yeah. no, uh, okay, so we have the addition rule. You, you start at 15 minutes late, so you can go on 15 Just tell me when I should stop. Okay, I, I don't want to take up. So you have the addition rule, and you have all seen this, and you have the multiplication rule. The multiplication rule is the probability of x1 equals x1 and x2 equals x2. And that is equal to the probability that x1 equals x1 given x2 equals x2 multiplied by the probability of x2 equals x2. Just a comment. The middle term is called the conditional probability of the event supposing that x2 equals x2 is true. That is, when you write a conditioning statement, you are supposing that this particular event is true. So that is why I have a conditioning slash here and I have a semicolon here and this is how I go. Therefore, conditional probabilities are said to be in the subjunctive mood which means if the conditioning event was true, what can you say about the major event? Okay, uh, okay a couple of points. Uh, in the Kolmogorov setup, the first two of the three rules were considered to be axiomatic and the third rule of conditional probability was a definition. It is simply the ratio of two probabilities. So Kolmogorov defined conditional probability simply as the ratio of two probabilities and for Kolmogorov the only two rules that mattered were rule one and rule two. Kolmogorov also had a lot to say on the interpretation of probability and I'll say that tomorrow with some quotes of Kolmogorov. 
No, the ratio of uh, no, the, the ratio of these two probabilities will be. He just he just defined it as the ratio, but in the personalistic setup, there is a. I'll, I'll give me one or two slides further down the line. So, in the personal theory, what does this mean? The conditional probability mean. So, the definite interpreted the conditional probability is the amount staked by this person at time tau on the event x1 equals x1 in a two-sided bet, but under the stipulation that the bet is to be settled only if x2 equals x2 turns out to be true. All bets are off if this conditioning event does not tend. So that is the way definitely interpreted conditional probability. And I'll just say a few more things. Note that at time tau, the disposition of both x1 and x2 is not known. Thus, the subjunctive move. In other words, probability only makes sense for uncertain events. Even the conditioning event is an uncertain event. Because if the conditioning event becomes fully known, then it becomes a part of the history. And so that's the way the argument goes. Uh, this is the important convention. All quantities known to this person at time tau with certainty are written after the semicolon. All quantities known to this person, unknown to this person at time tau, but conjectured by this tau, this person are written with the vertical slash. This is very important because when we go to the, <coughs> let's see, how do we get back here? Yeah, Resume. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is very important because the notion of a likelihood is, give, is given birth via this particular uh, uh, interpretation. Okay, we have independence, dependence, and causality, and I believe there was some interest about causality, and uh, Julia Pearl has written a lot on causality. You will talk about it. Okay, I have uh, some reactions to what Julia Pearl has written, and uh, I'll leave it to, uh, uh, to you to pursue that, or we can talk about it. But I'll quickly slash through. These are, this is the notion of dependent and independent events, and you all know what it is, and the only comment I want to make is that dependence and causality are two different notions. Uh, unless you have more to say to that, I'll just skip on this. This is my interpretation of causality. Okay, let's go a little bit further. So where do we stand right now? We have discussed so far the interpretations of probability we have discussed the personalistic interpretation of probability, which is what makes somebody a Bayesian. Uh, we've said that there are three rules of probability. They are sacrosanct, the convexity rule, the addition rule, and the multiplication rule. Kolmogorov sees the multiplication rule as a definition. Definetti sees the uh, conditioning rule, or the multiplication rule, as a extension of his notion of a two-sided bet. He still interprets it as a financial uh, transaction between two individuals. Let's look at generalizing the rules of probability. For, for convenience, I'm going to skip these two, but recognize their presence in the personal context. No. <laughs> okay. The uh, multiplication rule generalizes, I mean, sorry, the addition rule generalizes as the probability of the ors is equal to the sum of those, and that is straightforward to see if the k, k events are mutually exclusive. And the multiplication rule also generalizes as if the, yeah, if they are independent, then it goes as a product. If they are not, there is a fix. Let's go to the more important question. Why these three rules of probability? Which is what I'm trying to answer you. We have these three rules. Why these three rules? There becomes a big uh, historical and philosophical discussion. There are two arguments. One is a pragmatic argument, and the other is a mathematical, logical argument. 
that not following these rules leads to incoherence or a sure loss no matter what. Oh, maybe I should just use this, is that right? Just hit uh, enter. There. Or hit down or hit down. Sorry? Or hit down or hit down. Uh, let me go back. Let me just see if there's anything in this slide. Okay. The first rule is called the scoring rule and it's due to De Finetti and generalized by Lindley. It was published in the ISI review, a nice paper by Lindley on saying why we need these three rules. And he basically makes the argument that if you are a scientist assessing uncertainty, not following the three rules of probability leads you to incoherence. It's a very nice paper. Original idea was by De Finetti and Lindley generalized it. The second is based on the axioms of rational behavior and these are called behavioristic axioms and it's due to Ramsey and Savage and my hope is to be able to discuss these tomorrow. A uh, little bit, so these are behavioristic and scoring rules. So one is a practical argument and the other one is a behavioristic argument uh, which, which is quite nice and uh, quite mathematical. What about Kolmogorov? Five minutes. Okay. So to Kolmogorov, probability is an undefined primitive and its axioms are given like commandments and it's a starting point for a mathematical theory of probability. So somewhere in Kolmogorov's writing, he uses this. So if you ask Kolmogorov, what do you mean by probability? Kolmogorov's answer, there are, there are some nice answers he gave. But he basically said, call probability an undefined primitive. He went through a lot of discussion as to why this interpretation or that interpretation. But in the end, he went along the same lines as Popper. The unfortunate thing is, Kolmogorov wrote this in Russian. Popper was writing in English. Kolmogorov was probably not reading Popper, and Popper was was reading Kolmogorov, but not, not as carefully. So I was in Moscow a few months ago, and I gave a talk before many students of Kolmogorov, including Sri Iyer. And I pointed something out. And I said, do you know who said this? And Sri Iyer looked and said, no. I said, well, you translated Kolmogorov's paper, and this is what he said. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about how Kolmogorov interpreted probability. He saw it as an undefined primitive. Cardano, an Italian polymath, discovered the axioms of probability as a way to gamble without a sure loss. Some psychologists, now this is becoming important, like Hahnemann and Tursky and some economists like Elias Ale and Ellsberg, claim that individuals do not like to be scored, nor do they behave according to the axioms of rational behavior and therefore cast pallor on entire probability and the entire machinery. And so there is a large group of people who completely reject probability as a way to quantify uncertainty. That does not include Kahneman and Tversky, though. They, they take Bayesian principles as the normative standard against which people fail. Yeah. Yes. And that's not rejecting but that argument. That's rejecting people, not probability. No, that <laughs> argument is due to Savage. Uh, fine. But Savage, I mean, Savage I mean, made that argument. That Kahneman, Tversky, and many of the others are buy into that argument, they accept that. I think Kahneman is always, uh, one of them is alive. They think Tursky is alive, I think. Kahneman's alive. Kahneman, Kahneman is alive. alive. Kahneman is always not, but, but. Maybe he's not an enthusiast, but still. Yes, he's not an enthusiast. He's more or less on the These arguments have opened doors to alternatives to probability, like possibility, upper and lower probabilities, and belief functions. Lindley and Savage reject some alternatives on grounds that the behavioristic axioms are normative. I, I was attributing this to Lindley and Savage. You think Kahneman <coughs> has bought them, but it doesn't matter. What Lindley... Lots of people bought them, I think, I think uh, oh, all, of this, all this comes back to what Eric was saying a little while ago. Uh, it's a question of, is, are you talking about a person or are you talking about an ideal reasoning machine given the data? And I think what a lot of Bayesian statisticians want to do is, what would an ideal reasoner do to...
what I probably will do is I maybe continue this tomorrow. Okay. Okay. In the hope that. Uh, okay, I'm happy to answer questions and close down. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions and then we'll move on. Uh, I think I'll just make a comment about you know there's development. This is again from the census table. There's uh, development by Cox on. Yeah. Which yeah. Is mentioned and I, that also arises exactly these three groups. Exactly. Uh, Cox from uh, Johns Hopkins, you know, the physicist, yeah. Cox and James, somebody else mentioned James, James to me. Uh, uh, they also come through this particular, uh, I don't think the problem is with those physicists and uh, the Bayesians, uh, that there is no dis disagreement between them. There may be a disagreement about, uh, some of them may like to look at probability as an objective thing. I think there may be a disagreement there. But the big disagreements are with uh, some others who kind of reject all these rules. So that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the Coxian development is more like what Raoul said. Uh, James, uh, not Jeffries, also has a development. I mean, that you have this ideal rational machine. Yeah. And, and you impose certain decoderator on what it should do. Correct. And from those decoderators, the rules are solved. Correct. And James also, uh, Jeffries also has those arguments in his book. So this is a very interesting topic. and. Uh, Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. The, the, well, uh, the prob I have it all written out because I want to convince you before you go, without buying you any beer, <laughs> that the objective view of relative frequency is riddled with inconsistencies. It, The objective Bayesian view, it's, it leads you to incoherence. For example, putting flat priors on real lines violate the rules of probability. They are prepared to put flat priors, like uh, Jim Berger, who is going to be in Vanarasi, and uh, Jose Bernardo. They want to come up with automatic priors. Sure. Put together answers that will satisfy the rest of the audience tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, like and uh, there is one more talk by Nozer, and uh, also plenty of time, so we'll stop here and move on to the next speaker since we are running a bit late. Thank uh, you. Let me, let me, let, let me re remove this.